Okay, I think we're live. Did you link me in the chat? Uh, yeah, so I'm live, so I'm just going to keep broadcasting and uh, I'm hopping in. Hey everyone, uh, welcome to this afternoon's broadcast of DustNet live in uh, at Now Play This, uh, an experimental festival for games and play. Um, I am streaming in a slightly strange location because it's a giant wasp in the room that I was due to be streaming in, and so I'm I'm <laughs> slightly hide trying to hide from a wasp at the moment um but yeah so welcome we're here today with nilson and milan who were the creators of dustnet if you guys want to quickly introduce yourselves sure uh we're twin brothers and uh together we've been creating works in and around games for a few years now uh a lot of my work in the past few years has been especially with uh, vr and ar and kind of the new spatial computing technologies that we have so this game was a journey result of that. And I can let you know, Oh yeah, and that's me. It's very different stuff. This is a <laughs> more my weird game and less his weird game, but we've been collaborating in and around it. So could you could you both explain to me uh, just a little bit about what Destiny is? Whereabouts are we at the moment? Uh, well, right now, actually, we should probably toggle Dust on because Dust somehow seems to disappear sometimes in this game. You can actually turn it on and off. So I'm going to hop in the game and actually hop over to one of these uh, floating terrorist heads. And I guess spawn point if you talk to him on the radio, he'll actually bring it back for a second. Uh, but the server is essentially uh, a persistent server where wherever you create uh, things on the map will stick around, and dust happens to kind of be the medium through which you create things, and uh, a leftover relic of the map that was part of the game Counter-Strike, uh, which was made in 1999, I believe. As a mm -hmm. for Half -Life. And so, like, I mean, in terms of sort of your, actually, no, maybe could you explain for people that are watching that perhaps aren't too familiar with Counter Strike what Counter Strike is, like, really briefly? Sure. So it's a it's a tactical shooter uh, that started actually as a mod uh, from the game Half Life, and in it you play as uh, terrorists or counter terrorists, and you fight to essentially uh, plant a bomb as a terrorist and as counter terrorists to try and defuse the bomb. So it's a game that kind of appeared right as, as events like the Gulf War and a lot of other you know, real-world events. Terrorists kind of became the, I guess, world villain of, of global politics. And we have essentially like a new Cowboys and Indians where counter-terrorism and terrorism is the plotline of Counter-Strike. And it's all about mm -hmm. uh, you playing as both sides. What's interesting is it's more like a chessboard where you play as both sides of the equation. Um, so it has a lot of historical context as well. It's interesting. And so was it was is Counter Strike a game that you sort of both played um, and that you were sort of the active sort of players in? What's your what's your history with Counter Strike? Well, what is your history with Counter Strike? I think we have a. Well, we I'd say it's, it's also as much about <laughs> Counter Strike as it is about I think the Source Engine and yeah, the community yeah. tools that were a huge part of that. So I was um, mostly playing Team Fortress Two, which is a game mm -hmm. I think that would emerge around the same time out of that out of mods from Half Life. So for me, um, it's it's not only Dustnet, it's about the idea that you'd have these community servers um, and you'd have people congregating around them and really making them their own. And then how that's become pretty much a relic of the past now that we have match-made servers, um, not as many tools, I think, accessible to players. And so like, I know that sort of Dustnet is um, obviously sort of a your own sort of model variation of um, one of the sort of key maps from uh, Counter-Strike. Could you explain a bit about, and forgive me if I pronounce it wrong, DE Dust 2, uh, the sort of iconic map from Counter-Strike. And the, could you explain the resonance or the relevance of that map with, uh, with, with regards to Dustnet? Yeah, there's been a lot of, uh, I mean, essentially it is the most popular Counter-Strike map. That's the easiest way to explain it, is that this by far is the most played virtual space in that series and, and definitely one of the most played virtual spaces in general within gaming outside of MMOs, which you could argue, you know, have a lot more hours put into them. But 
Uh, mm-hmm. It kind of came out of nowhere. Dave Johnston was a map maker. He was in his teenage years. I think he was about to go into college. And he'd been, he created, you know, Dust 1, which was quite popular. So they naturally commissioned the Dust 2. <laughs> and That's a good question, actually. Yeah, what came before Dust Dust 2? Like, obviously yeah, the Dust 1. Was there a Dust, Dust 3 at all? Well, it gets even weirder that you asked that because he actually was going to call Dust 2 <laughs> Dust 3 and there was never going to be a Dust 2. Uh, he just wanted to play a prank on everybody and make Dust 3 the next sequel. Uh, but it, in the end, I think someone talked him out of naming it Dust 3 and there never was a <laughs> Dust 3. There only is Dust 2 as far as I know. Might be a secret map file on his computer somewhere hiding the next version. But uh, he kind of knocked it out of the park on this one. Uh, a lot of the mistakes that he thought were going to be terrible, unplayable parts of the map ended up being kind of these iconic uh, like uh, parts of the map. Like, for example, he ran out of space on the editor to create more map, I think, for what's called Long, which is where I'm walking right now. And uh, and Long is now kind of this crazy stretch of, of space on the map that's... And I'm not quite getting the story right, but it, it, you can see it's quite simple, actually. It's just a long corridor, but... It ends up being this iconic space where you have mm. people with snipers and, and rifles trying to battle for control of it. Um, well, I kind of like the fact that you're saying that you're sort of getting the story a little bit wrong or that you're sort of half remembering it. This idea of sort of these histories and these stories sort of getting retold and sort of slightly changed in, in their retelling. And I think that's something that for me sort of that I really love about this piece is that um, I know we've talked about so, sort of what the work is, but not perhaps so much about the sort of speculative aspects of this, that that obviously the stuff that I've read about this game is that this is set in this sort of speculative sort of future of um, sort of the death or the afterlife of Counter-Strike. And that this is the last, um, that I'm assuming, or uh, I'm, I hope I'm remembering this correctly, like that this is the last remaining sort of remnants of of that game and of that map and and the fact that there's this sort of narrative that you've built around sort of dust now could you talk a bit more about that sort of speculative um i guess sort of future that you're that this work is sort of um i guess sort of based within yeah i mean someone just hit dust again so we never have to talk without dust being present but uh <laughs> it's, it's two decades old so when you're kind of in dust now you can kind of think of the map that you're in as, as you know being around for for 20 years and, and this game would then maybe speculate, I'm not sure how long from now, maybe another two decades. I think it will be a little longer before it will stop playing Counter-Strike. But, you know, what happens when a game dies, right? A lot of people like to say, oh, that game's dead, or no one plays that anymore. They kind of actually mm-hmm. relish when a game dies, when the community fades away and, and people stop playing it. I think people like new spaces. But there's a few like Dust that I've hung around. and. I don't know in this universe, in Dustnet specifically, in the fiction where players have gone, but for some reason or another, maybe everyone likes VR headsets better finally, uh, no one seems to be playing Counter-Strike anymore, and especially no one is playing Dust. Uh, so I just use that as a device to look at, well, between the people who have played Dust in this game, like it is very much like a cathartic experience for me to have made this, as someone who has spent a lot of time in that space. What is that? What does that space mean to me? If will it ever disappear in my lifetime, or will dust mm-hmm, hang around mm-hmm. my entire life or our lives? Um, and this game actually offers no answers to that. I have no idea whether people are going to put down or pick <laughs> this up This is going to be my questions. I was going to pitch to you like answer yeah, exactly. Because I, but, for, but what I do know, somebody... the thing is that what I do know is yeah. that Dustnet will continue to exist throughout my life. So now Dustnet, because I have a physical PC with Dustnet on it, this version of the map will stick yeah. around forever and ever. And that's what's interesting is this project is part of like, docufiction that is preserving the map in some form or another. Sorry, the, the wasp that I mentioned at the beginning of the stream, somebody's <laughs> come in and the wasp is now deceased. So uh, that's that's bad news. Congrats. Actually, that's a bad thing. F's in the chat for the wasp that's just been killed. Um, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so so in reg- like I'm somebody who has worked um, sort of as a curator um, and at the at the Victorian Albert Museum and um, a lot of the conversations that are happening so much sort of within games curation is about about the sort of permanence or the ephemerality of, um, of video games and obviously digital objects. And I think I like the fact that this work sort of speaks to this sort of fictional, um, sort of speculative future about sort of the permanence or impermanence of that work. So I, w- I was going to ask, like, I know you've said that you're not offering any answers, but um, for you, is that is that idea of sort of digital preservation something that you've sort of worked with before or that you're interested in um or sort of what 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 sort of um what sort of sparked your thinking around that sort of area 
Um, I definitely want to let Milan pipe in too about what he thinks about this because we have very different ideas when we talk about this work, um, what it's about. But for me, there was an essay that I read uh, titled, Is the Internet Dead? And it asks, did the internet die? And really what it means is more, did the internet, and maybe I'm actually kind of evading your question, but, but it talks about how the, in, the internet kind of is now, or sorry, I forgot to push my, uh, push to talk fine. Uh, did I get any of that? I think I talked for half of that. Um, a little bit. Um, yeah, so I mean, the I, internet I is solidified, in and, and right now the internet's kind of like, now it's it's been fully formed and industrialized, and this kind of made me think, well, what's going to happen with virtual space now as we continue to industrialize virtual space with things like live streamers and esports athletes and all other professions, like back when we had World of Warcraft gold mining, uh, what kind of other mm -hmm. things will creep into that space so that doesn't really have to do with preservation so much but this game was more like preserving what used to be virtual space before we now have i think the industries that and and the the content that's now being created about these worlds is very different it used to be more uh just about modding and playing and you couldn't really you know make quick buck um uh, you know playing these games like you can now and not to undermine the work that streamers do it actually is very difficult but that's kind of my thinking right now is, is virtual space and the old virtual space is quite dead and we now think of it and work in it in very different ways. Yeah. And so, so just, just as a step back as well, like what are both of your backgrounds? Hey, Melinda, I'm giving you this one. You got to, I come, I come from a bit, bit of an arts background. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and specifically electronic uh, writing and literature, which is a very interesting academic background. But then I, I was just more interested in games um, because of their, I guess, pop culture appeal and entertainment value. So, yeah, for me, it's about creating something in games that maybe goes a little bit beyond that, but still captures a bit of that, um, that excitement that makes the medium, I think, so, so powerful, mm -hmm. so appealing and seductive. Um, but I, I go back to the archaeology or the speculative future question, because I'm, I'm interested in saying something about, about that. Mm-hmm is that I think about dust as being more like a like a failed speculative future where there, there isn't any permanence and using that not so much to say that we should have permanence or archiving, that's not so much the message of it, but looking at the way that people, these things are already in their common imagination and seeing how in a space like dust where people are allowed or given the tools to create, how you see tons of other pop culture things manifested in it. And it's, it's not so much that I think preserving preserving dust is necessarily the message, but um, when, when given the space to um, like leave a mark, players will do so. And you'll see that dust can come up again and again in different contexts. And all these different game worlds are sort of like inter, interacting with each other in this giant like game physical space metaverse right now. Um, and I think that's what's interesting is the virtual spaces, spaces are really just like... Um, communicating with each other across games and across mediums. Yeah, and I really like that idea of sort of understanding communication because I think it's something that I know I've really been challenged with when thinking about like preservation and archiving of digital works is understanding that games and video games are sort of, um, they're a conversation that they are both sort of the digital materiality, um, but also the performance of the person playing and mm -hmm. the interaction between the two. So. For me, it's something that that even when you focus on the ability to um, preserve games and you try and preserve sort of the digital aspect, you try and preserve that materiality, that the part that you can never really capture is the is that sort of relationship and is that live sort of aspect of people engaging with or interacting with a game that no two people will play a game in the same way. No people will sort of experience a work in the exact same way. And yes, you can make efforts to sort of record and archive that, but actually... Um, that games are things which to me that sort of live and die in the moment that we play them and there's many different iterations and I think that's what I like about sort of um, as you talk about this that it's this failed speculative future but maybe it's not I guess not necessarily a failure more than it is just sort of um, this creative sort of attempt to rethink actually what our conversations about preservation should be and not perhaps focusing on that sort of perfect recreation of the original work but appreciating that sort of ongoing conversation that happens with the different ways that people game, play games and the different ways that when they're playing them as well, they recreate them as well and they redesign them in different ways. Completely, yeah. 
I, I think if there's one thing this this game's taught me, it's very unfocused. There's just too many endpoints for me, and it's a complete mess. But I kind of love what I made anyway, despite it just being pretty much an entry point to about pretty much anything to do with the virtual space. Because I couldn't really pick. Yeah, up and the, the players are ultimately going to decide. So is it is is the work something that you're building on then? Like, what are you doing more with this? Uh, well, the installation part is something I want to start bringing to to more places, but there really isn't a whole mm -hmm. lot I'll do uh, past past the initial release. Uh, right now, we'll kind of see how the server evolves over time. If we see, you know, a year from now, what what kind of changes? If people still find it interesting to modify this space. I mean, I'm not the first to create yeah. kind of these, these virtual wastelands that people can inhabit. Uh, I mean, I'm mm -hmm. always definitely a large influence on this game, um, which people can check out, but it's now also kind of a, a finished game that was really just a performance for, I think, about you know a week or so. Um, Wait, which which work did you say was an inspiration? Could you repeat that? Uh, I'm Null, uh, which was also an asymmetrical game where the, the creator of the game performed a character that other players kind of uh, watched and, and saw. And it was a very, like, very mm -hmm. harsh game. You, you just entered an integer, and that was your login name. So you're all just simple lines and sticks on another wireframe landscape. And uh, every person that the Null touched, Null was the character that the creator played, uh, would be instantly banned. Mm -hmm. So it, it was kind of an interesting hellscape of um, multiplayer games. Yeah, and again, I really like that idea of performance with it. When you talk about sort of the fact that you're interested in exploring the installation aspect of that, that, um, and obviously I asked this question with the very much in mind of the intention that obviously Dustnet was something that we were looking to, or we were going to exhibit as a sort of physical interactive installation at Somerset House this weekend. But what is that what you mean when you say installations? And if so, what other sort of ways has the work been exhibited or presented in public? Um, well, it's a little bit of a side, but part of the early server was that it had to be constantly alive or it would die and everything would be erased, which was a very mm -hmm. punishing version of the game. But I like the idea of installing it so it can, quote, live in that same way that it had to before. And parts of it being alive in the sense that it's, it's always on display or accessible, the way that anyone can join this game at any time and build something. And what does it mean for the uptime to be always on or always online or always connected? Or would it be interesting at one point for the game to go offline for a bit? Um, mm -hmm. There was another project that was interesting, which was a shared Minecraft world that was passed around on a USB stick. And, oh, and yeah. Jason Roy project, yeah. Uh, but ideas around, yeah, I guess how space could be passed around, right? Just other paradigms other than being online and in the cloud 24 7. Um, yeah. What was that called? Is that Chain World or if I miss it? I might be remembering it. Yeah, it's Chain World. Yeah. And I think there's, there's something for me as well that sort of resonates a lot with, um, I guess, as an event that has shifted from being a physical real world event. And for me as a curator, that's the stuff that I'm personally interested in is, and I've never really sort of had to explore why I really appreciate physical events or in world real life events when actually the work that I deal with is digital and um, sometimes sits much more naturally in different environments. But that idea of that, um, of that translation, but... Um, but I think there's there's aspects about sort of what you're saying about chain world where there's something that sort of makes things quite scarce or makes things sort of time bound or puts sort of like a certain requirement. And I think when you step into an exhibition space that there's also this sort of reverence or way of acting that sort of changes your behavior. And I think for me, that's stuff that I've been really interested to sort of explore is how do you do that? Um, how do you do that in different ways? And I think that's interesting that you're saying or referring to things like Chain World, where I think there's aspects of scarcity with um, projects like that, which sort of, which for me really resonate. And I think I'm assuming that what you're saying as well from um, from this work as well, that that's something that, is that something that you think is important to yourselves and important to this project? Uh, I think I'd more just as an artist and creator see the importance of experiences and and how scare experiences now try and create scarcity versus the the multiplicity of an online world that's accessible from anywhere and like kind of how those ideas could converge in some in some way. Mm -hmm. I think the very very like rough clay right now though. Um, I think I, I like the idea and I as of where the game might go. I, I always love the idea that it would be a sort of like Tower of Babel that leaves behind dust and just. The players eventually get so far off of it that it pretty much ceases to be a feature of the map. Mm -hmm. um, and in that respect, I think if it you know uh, it was installed and it was interacted with over a period of time, that you'd you'd be left with this artifact. And even if the artifact isn't completely preserved, it's got that mythic quality that I think Chain World is going for. Um, that 
that sort of folklore of where I'm mm. And so when, you, when you're talking about sort of, um, I guess, sort of scarcity of experience or sort of limiting that experience that I know obviously that there are different ways that people experience or can play Dustnet and that there's obviously limitations on how many people can play. Could you, could you talk about a little bit more about sort of the different ways that people can play and sort of the limitations on the server as well? Uh, sorry, the, the limitations of the server. I was, I was yeah, so, so, so a, the, a <laughs> streaming problem right now. This is multitasking is taking a toll on me. I, I, I can talk about it because it's multi multi platform, right? So, um, the the idea is to sort of like ironically mimic mimic the structure of um, community servers where you have admins um, and then players, and then you'll you'll also have um, generally people that will idle in the server because they want to keep the uptime of the server as high as possible so that the server rank stays high. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the AR players are, for the most part, spectators, um, and they would be sort of the idlers, the people that watch without being an in-game player. And so there's, uh, there's four people who can play through AR at any one time, is that right? Is that it? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's the right number, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and so, sorry, I'm going to try and focus again on the conversation now that I'm done fixing that trouble. <laughs> um, the scarcity of like the VR player is very much connected to the scarcity of the devices and how unlikely it might be for a VR player to join the server uh, when you're playing it. And really early designs of this game were less about dust and more about like a virtual ecosystem where those devices actually kind of um, were inflected on that ecosystem where players would have to create symbiotic relationships with between and across the lines of an augmented reality to a virtual reality to a computer player. And the ideas were more around uh, those devices having some effect on your unique player type. Um, that, that design was a little too ambitious, but, but parts of that are still kind of in the design for this game where you can see the differences between the players. Mm -hmm. And so we have like these sort of three different layers that you have this sort of augmented reality. And I think from, and correct me if I'm wrong, that from what I've understood that there's almost a hierarchy across different players that you have sort of the people at the bottom sort of with the with the AR, then you have the people sort of connecting through PC, which I think is there 10 people for PC, is that right? Yeah, so you can have 10 computer players who are kind of the bottom of the food chain in a way. And then you have oh, okay. AR players, which are kind of just like a medium between the two. And then VR oh, players, okay. which are them definitely the top. Because you can't really do anything to a VR player, you can't destroy them. You can kind of like turn off their weapons for a bit if they're annoying you, but other than that, they kind of do as they please. Uh, and they're, so, and they're really large too. We'll try and get a VR player in soon so people can see, but they're very yeah, large. I was thinking, yeah. So. yeah, I can see you're just looking at those giant hands in the sky. Is that sort of idle VR players um, or signifying? Sorry, let me turn off cells. that large synth noise really quickly. I think we forgot to hook <laughs> up that noise to the volume dial, so it's very loud. Um, but yeah, those are the idle kind of. There used to be, I think, a more culty I'm null influence that was definitely leaking into the game. Um, yeah, so those are them, and they animate into place when someone joins the server. Giant god hands in the sky, very, very imposing. And yeah. do we do we know if we've got anybody playing? They make a crazy playing? noise when they join too, so you'll get to hear that. I, I'll, I'll try jumping into VR right now. Okay, let's I wonder which pair of hands it's going to be. Uh, oof, I should, okay, I'll keep an eye out. I'm going to let you know when you hop in. And so in terms of that sort of player hierarchy across the three, and I know you've talked a bit about sort of ecosystems, but um, but could you, yeah, could you talk a little bit more about sort of that nature, that hierarchy and how, how that ties perhaps into the, the sort of mythology or the fiction around the work? Um, well, I just wanted to create a resource system definitely to try and incentivize like player activity. Like there were very boring designer goals around that. I think, there we go, Milan's hands definitely animated under the ground. Let's see if we can see him. He's, that's what happens when your headset's on the floor, is everything just kind of crumbles into into oblivion. Just a oh, I need to change my um, video input before it starts working. There we go. Um, so the kind of hierarchy resource part was, was the, the symbiotic kind of thesis of could I create some sort of interactions between all these different people and structure the play outside of just Counter-Strike uh, to see kind of could, could they be distracted out of playing Counter-Strike. Um, mm -hmm. Because when you plant the bomb, it doesn't really do a whole lot, to be honest. It just kind of explodes and everything goes back to normal for a second. Um, so playing Counter-Strike only gets you so far in this game, and I wanted to try and see when you're building, what kind of activities could we create for you to kind of work together to build uh, on top of Counter-Strike. 
But it's yeah, just and I just, you know, not letting players build a million things a second and delete a million mm -hmm. things a second and all the boring problems that can be pretty soon. So what is the, so in terms of sort of the capabilities of what players can do in, in here, sort of what, what are the sort of player actions? What can people um, do within this server and what, are the, what is limited and what is different from, I guess, sort of playing Counter-Strike? Yeah, there's uh, definitely a lot that's been built on top of it. One of the weird ones is T-Posing that kind of just came in on a random day that <laughs> I knew that's something new, where you can kind of show your team, like you can show if you're a terrorist or counter-terrorist because there's still the scaffolding of that structure at the base layer. Mm -hmm. Um, editing is obviously the most prominent feature where I can create, uh, one of the archetypes, you kind of have like three elements in all games, which is lava, water, <laughs> and solid. <laughs> so you can create one of three elements, uh, lava, of course, instantly killing you. And water allows you to kind of somewhat like in the source games and the source engine, which Counter-Strike was made, allows you to reorient your momentum. So you can actually, if you create enough water structures all over the map, you can actually move in this really fluid way. Um, so editing, fighting, flying, like kind of like no clipping. A lot of, actually I think what's interesting to talk about that we haven't yet is the administrative and like admin features and servers that people mm -hmm. who run games of Counter-Strike need to do in order to control the community, which I actually then kind of brought into the game as like the idea of a power-up. So admin is almost a power-up where you can then uh, unlock certain features and parts of the game that usually are just uh, only locked and kept under you know, lock and key for people who need to control their communities and um, discipline and punish people on the server. But kind of leaking all those commands into the actual gameplay of, of Dustnet itself. So this idea of um, when you're talking about sort of community and community, community control, but, um, but also when you're talking about sort of the ability for players to sort of edit and, and create within here, was there a specific type of behavior that you were anticipating from players when you put those th those sort of systems or those controls in place? Um, and has there been any behavior or any responses from players which has been, I guess, sort of for better or worse, unexpected? Uh, one thing I, I liked is is the exploratory players who try and, and break things as much as possible when in good faith, when trying to act as not you know break things in a bad way. <laughs> Uh, so one of the most interesting ones that I sadly broke today was someone who tried to go to the lowest reported depth of Dustnet. And at that depth, and in your computer, the floating point errors, numbers actually start breaking down because of their complexity. And so I can't really go there now, I'll try and go. But actually everything every, everything in the rendering becomes broken. Like the entire engine just has a, has a fit. Um, so people who try to actually break the game in other ways by just exploring outside of where they're supposed to go. And that's like a usual feature of most games. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the structures, you know, luckily everyone's just kind of built their own things. No one's, no one's been like tampering and there hasn't been a lot of cross-pollination is the interesting part. People kind of stick to their own stuff and they build something and they're happy with it and they, and they leave. <laughs> so there's, it's interesting <laughs> that people kind of build their own cabin and their own little landmark and then they're happy they've left their mark and then they can exit the game. That's nice. That's very polite. <laughs> yeah, it's very, very polite, but also very like nice. you sort of have this sort of like nice sort of idea of like, oh, everyone's going to come together like a community and everyone's going to raise a barn and have these collaborative projects. And it's like, actually, no, we're all just shy little kids and we're just going to stay in our corner at the sand pit and make a tiny little castle over here. And once I'm happy, I'm done. I'm off. But, so, um, so here's the now play this sign. Someone so oh, the team, uh, came in who and made left that? Mark. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that's another one is sign writing. We have a have a nice day sign, which um i think they are the only two right now so but but sign like writing a is a nice big day. one you know yeah mm -hmm. poetry mm -hmm. there's been some poetry on the server too a few people there was a very touching note that was left on the server about uh someone apparently their brother was kind of getting on their nerves so they kind of left a sign to to kind of <laughs> back off their brother you know like come on stop stop bullying me uh so there's been a few personal like actual landmarks that have been left for other people to find um, which has been interesting, mm -hmm. like that kind of expression, um, which is definitely a whole other world we can also tap into now, which is, I guess, how people grow up in adolescence on virtual spaces, which is on Counter-Strike. Still, you have all these bizarre servers, which act more as communal, you know, just like a public spaces, people to talk and chat rather than play Counter-Strike, right? Like a lot of these rooms yeah. mostly exist within like the bunny hopping community and, and bee hopping is this weird movement system where you can... Essentially, what I'm doing right now, which is navigate quickly around 
uh, a virtual space by holding the jump key down, and you just keep on gathering speed until you reach dizzying proportions. Wait, and this is as somebody who's like a bit of a, um, I don't, again, sort of as somebody who's not uh, na na naturally sort of or necessarily very um, proficient in Counter-Strike or has played a lot, that, um, but the parts of that game that I'm really fascinated by is the stuff that's come out of the communities. And there's uh, Counter-Strike Surfing, which I've spent a lot of time on YouTube watching various videos of, of people doing that and sort of like just creating these entirely different sort of movesets and different maps off that. Is that something that's connected to that movement or is that something that's completely different? Yeah, very connected. Yeah, so surfing is, is the older brother of, of b-hopping, which is you can use mm -hmm. curved surfaces to yeah, realign momentum. Um, but those, those like folksy communities are fascinating. So that's why when I talk about like folklores within Dustnet, I really, the first thing I think about is surfing. Um, and surfing is a whole map community that dedicates their life to essentially creating these fun kinetic uh, maps that you can surf, well, surf, you know, surf along. Um, and I think yeah, there's, I mean, there's something really nice about the sort of contrast of watching some of those videos that you have this sort of very ministry of sound, sort of chill out, sort of soundtrack sometimes on the videos of people moving around, but always front and center in the middle is still like a giant knife or a gun that just seems so sort <laughs> exactly, of yeah. like... That they pay $300 for it too. Yeah, like a yeah. really expensive knife. <laughs> It's like, oh, it's just like somebody, they're just surfing in this really beautiful romantic way and we've just got this giant weapon still in the middle of the screen. Like, don't forget this is still a video game. <laughs> and that's why I'm keeping my AK-47 out right now while I play. I could hide it, but, you know, I want to let people know it's still a video game at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've spent point, yeah. tons of time uh, rocket jumping in Team Fortress 2. Um, so for me, I think it, it maybe wasn't surprising at all that people pretty much completely left the bomb objective behind in Dustin. Um, and preferred to do either creative or just like movement oriented activities. Um, mm -hmm. So, so for me, my my perfect version of the game is just uh, one giant rocket jumping server. Mm -hmm. And so, like I, I think somebody mentioned that someone in the chat had said that they'd also built a uh, version of Dust in Minecraft. Have you seen other people do sort of similar projects or similar homages to at the map? Uh, well, I mean, across other video games, sure, right? When it's whenever it's replicated, um, but I think you mean dedicated, like, like bespoke, like yeah. Our projects. Yeah. Uh, there's been a few that I that I came across. I mean, definitely we had Robert Yang on the on the now play this yesterday, and he's mm -hmm. done a lot of work looking at those maps. But Aaron Barthol uh, is a new media artist who tried to print out the arches of dust. So I'm gonna load the map back in, but the arches are very you know, important check, uh, choke point in the map. So he tried to create, he just made this entire huge sculpture where you could walk through this arch uh, in real life to try and experience what it might be to walk through mm -hmm. that choke point as a person and not just as a virtual avatar. Um, Wait, what was the name of the artist again? Uh, I'm not quite saying the name right. Aram, A-R-A-M, Barthol, B-A-R-T-H-O-L-L, something like that. Um, and he'd done a few... I think he actually wanted to create an entire real life dust that was full scale, but only could find mm. the doorway <laughs> at the moment. So uh, that's the first one that comes to mind. Um, but yeah, I think I think people have created, and there has been there's an undisclosed uh, real life creation of dust too. There's just random images that popped up online. I don't think anyone knows where it actually is, but someone created a brick a brick dust. There's some parts of the map that have been replicated. And so, as you say, sort of Robert Yang, uh, we had him uh, on the festival yesterday hosting a very, uh, it was quite a bloody, actually, field trip through Half-Life, where several of the... Um, <laughs> <laughs> we lost a few people to a couple of elevators on the way, which was quite funny. Um, but, um, but like, he, he did a really good job, of, I guess, of sort of talking about sort of the architecture and talking about the buildings. But is there anything, um, when you're talking about things like the arches and such, is there anywhere on the map? I don't know. Obviously, there's a lot of stuff that's being built on top of it. But are there sort of these iconic places on the map that you can take us to or show us here? That, um, that you're sort of referencing? I guess I'll go to the first Easter egg, um, which is which I kept in the in the project, which is uh, a message that the map creator left on the map. Here, I'll try and stand up right next to it. Um, so this is the credit. So he left this behind the, the spawn point for uh, mm -hmm. counter-terrorists. And it's pretty simple, right? But no one can, you can't see it unless you try and glitch out of the map. Um, but it's very somber. <laughs> Uh, he left. He credits it to people, and then you know 
all he neglected or ignored or lost. Oh. So it's a very like serious credit uh, for some reason. And and part of that is I can show you the other Easter egg, which is there's also actually um, a memorial for a different map maker, uh, map maker mm. who passed away. And uh, I don't think it's actually in connection with that, um, but there, this actually does exist if you still go back and play the original Counter Strike, only on the original one. Uh, this actually, this memorial plus that credit still exists, um, and you have to, like I said, get out of the map to see them. But so there's there's a lot of personal history in this map, which is very interesting. That still persists in the original yeah. version. Uh, that's been kind of sanitized and scrubbed away now in the new one, um, because it's been updated obviously so many times. Mm -hmm. Probably in its fourth or fifth edition now. I wonder in terms of sort of people placing these things in games and especially I guess sort of at those points in here I, I wonder how much there was this expectation that somebody would eventually find that or somebody would eventually sort of break out of the map that um and to to, to see those but um, oh yeah it's wonder... very simple in Counter-Strike like you just have to type in yeah. no clip and then you can fly through the wall and see it. Oh okay. Um, yeah they're not really meant to be hidden hidden but to the normal player yeah. who just goes about their day playing Counter-Strike, they'll never see To it. me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, to me until so I was started it, the project too, but yeah. Yeah. It was, there was another work that we were due to have at the festival as well, which was um, a project, a, a project, I guess, sort of um, something that was undertaken by a collective of games designers and artists in Australia who, and, uh, who were a gang of grannies who, um, traveled out of bounds from Red Dead Redemption 2 and just sort of they, they they transcribed and talked about their experiences getting out of bounds in that game on a, on a really long sort of Twitter thread and it was this really beautiful evocative images and they wrote about it in such a beautifully poetic way that um, for me I think that's part of my some of my favorite sort of um, ways of engaging with games it's not not necessarily even sort of playing them then it is sort of experiencing other people as you say sort of breaking them or sort of um, experiencing them in different ways and I think it just creates this in it provides this incredibly different perspective on the materiality of those works and and in a completely sort of unexpected ways I totally agree like I always the, the feeling that I wanted to evoke I think in this game at first was like the feeling of being at a server at 3 a.m. and when you're on those servers uh, most people will like you'll start actually getting like folk rules people will start trying to play for example knives only like they'll try and invoke, mm -hmm. like with trust, they'll try and add new rules to the game. And I think that that's, for me, the most interesting meaty part of games is not like when you hop on matchmaking at 5 a.m. and you're playing against everybody else who's trying to blow off steam. It's more like, you know, the, the late hours of like, well, is this game actually fun? How can we make other ways of fun? And a big yeah. part of that as well was when I was doing my research for this and went back to the original Counter-Strike, I don't know if it was just the rose-tinted glasses, but... The communities felt a lot more genuine. The people who stuck around to, see, to still play the game from 1999 were very calm and relaxed. There wasn't like the usual like, if you hop onto a competitive game now, like we need to win, we need to crush, I need to get my kill death ratio up. Everyone was very relaxed. They were just hanging out. Everyone knew each other by name. You know, it was very. It was a total blast from the past. So I actually encourage people to try and go back to games that are older, aged, that have that kind of rich community now for people who have stuck around. Yeah, just sort of realize that there's so much sort of still that's been, un, I guess, unexplored with ways of creating within the constraints of older works and older games. And I really love sort of, I feel like as though in different degrees that any act of playing a game in some way is an act of creativity, that yes, the designers can sort of guide you in some respect as to how you're supposed to play and everybody brings with them some level of literacy about the expectations of, okay, well, I know if this is a platform that I head in this direction and that... I should be working towards this stuff, but um, but I really love it that sort of when people really push that and they have that sort of emergent sort of gameplay or creativity. Have there, have there been any games and things that you've seen people creating or playing in here? I know we've talked about sort of constructions and things that people have created, but has there been an, any emergent gameplay that you've witnessed? Uh, I didn't actually quite give enough tools, I think, for really emergent gameplay uh, to to create rules from. But a lot of people creating funny hot courses courses to like try and jump on uh technically so you don't fall to your death like those kind of things usually when it has to do with platforming or jumping or movement uh you can kind of have fun with that um and people as well I don't, like, who I don't tried actually fight. you know what the funniest part was people who tried to actually mm -hmm. play counter-strike in this game who <laughs> said go on let's really <laughs> try and play counter-strike and that was the most difficult thing was trying to do that that's funny that that's the one game that you know the one game that you can't play in here is Counter Strike, I'm afraid. Yeah, but no, I don't. I don't quite buy it. And, yeah. I don't quite buy it when you say that you didn't put enough rules in because I was at a gallery opening um, the other night for uh, Light Like Online, which is a Pittsburgh gallery for 
um, sort of experimental and alternative video games. And uh, the one of the gallery owners, Paolo Pettuccini, had created this very small sort of like bitsy MMO online. And all you could do really was just sort of walk around and type about sort of 20 characters into a chat and um, and tap your character to dance. But still, still, even within that tiny space and maybe... Maybe it was sort of biased because it's a bunch of game designers effectively that have turned up. But even in that tiny space, people are still trying to come up with games. I mean, I'm not going to say that they were the most exciting games. Most of it consisted of people trying to run quickly from one side of, um, of this tiny, tiny MMO room to the other. So, um, yeah, I guess maybe it's that sort of like old thing that sort of people, the cliche of like, things aren't boring, you're just boring. But um, but there's all, I think there's even when you're working within sort of really limited constraints, there's always weird games or weird ways of play that you can come up with. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's the tyranny. If you're bored, it's your fault at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it may be arguable, right? Um, yeah, I think I'll, I wish I could get a VR player on. A lot of interesting things, I think, were, for example, you can, they can hold you in their hand and a lot of other stuff like that. It was, I think, corralling people. People were very interested in corralling in the space because it's so wide open and large, mm -hmm. right? So how can we try and build community and get people uh, without killing, right? Because most people didn't want to kill after about 10 minutes. It would kind of fade away. Um, but getting people from point A to point B or teleporting, um, you're right. The very momentary spur of the moment things. So people are like, herding cats mm -hmm. in the space, right? They're just going to wander wherever they want to wander. Yeah. So one of the one of the comments that has come up from the chat is um, sort of the the comparisons that people have said that they kind of feel like this is how Snow Crash was was in their mind or how they'd imagine Snow Crash. Can you talk a little bit more about the sort of aesthetic choices and the visual art style of the game? Yeah, I just wanted a really kind of simple, very very simple uh, look. I really didn't want to have to retexture dust or like rethink of dust, and I d actually didn't also want to go back to the original textures on the map. And so removing the texture was the easiest way to get at that, I felt. So mm -hmm. really just as minimal as possible, a player would have to build back up onto the project. So they're kind of left with nothing. It is entirely a, such a breath of fresh air where all of a sudden everything that was on the map gets deleted or something and you're just left with a blank canvas. So that feeling is like very powerful. So having just the wireframe and nothing else to distract from that was, I think, just to bring attention to the basic geometry of the shapes and the physicality of the space and its virtualness was most important so as you can tell it's just very very minimal as much as possible yeah somebody just pointed out as well that somebody just logged in under the name of res which uh they said was very on point that's a very good point that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so now so, we've broken um, the yeah. uh broken the player limit oh no we're still good okay let me know if we need to actually uh boot anyone off the server if there's people rearing to get in because i'm doing a bad job of monitoring right now <laughs> Yeah, but somebody in the chat just said that they tried to join and it's full. Um, I okay, cried. Let's try and let's try and get volunteers. Let's we'll <laughs> be in the spirit of play. If there's volunteers who want to who help volunteers to, to 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 jump off the stream <laughs> or jump off the server? Did those two people? Who, oh, three people just left. Wow. Oh, okay. thank, thank you. you. Everybody. Oh, yeah. yeah. Maybe 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 it would be too too sort of uh, pleading and then everybody leaves. Yeah. It's like oh, everyone like <laughs> like can leave the party, please. <laughs> polite player base. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, not the book. So somebody volunteered as tribute. <laughs> I should be looking at Twitch chat here. Let me get my Twitch chat up. Sorry, chat. You've been neglected from my standpoint. I'm not a very good multitasker. <laughs> I think as, as somebody who's never, um, myself and probably the rest of the Now Play This team, as people that have never really dealt with streaming I have, I mean, I always understood that it was going to be hard to manage playing and chat and talking and keeping your train of thought whilst um, like an Animal Crossing trying to emote and talk seems to be something that is way beyond my mental capabilities. So I have a newfound respect for, um, or much, much deeper respect for anybody that manages to stream. I don't know how you juggle sort of um, holding any sort of coherent um, conversations whilst doing this. So uh, you're doing a great job, Nelson. Yeah, thank you. End. No, I'm trying my best right now. I'm <laughs> barely, my brain's splitting at the same time. <laughs> That's what I love about surfing is you can really turn off your brain and just go into the, you know, whatever flow state. And uh, that's that's sort of mindless at a certain point. It's almost like meditation. Right. So, yeah. so what, are, what are you both working on at the moment? Um, I know you've talked about um, sort of installations for this, but are there any other projects that you're doing that sort of, I guess, sort of continue on the sort of threads or streams or strands that... We started with Dustnet, or um, are you working on things that are totally different? 
I think Milan, you got something for that. I'm I'm in pre-production yeah. or something, but it's not quite ready to <laughs> talk about. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on a game that it's not it's not so much about flow states, um, but it's a very abstract game about moving through thought loops, and those thought loops mm. are represented as webs of points. And uh, the idea behind that is more about finding um, some sort of poetic connection between game loops and thinking. Um, so. I guess uh, stylistically it would seem similar because it is just the uh, white on black um, points and lines. So <laughs> it's got it's got the uh, screen print aesthetic, um, but I think it's addressing different issues. Um, okay. And that's probably going to be released later this year, but um, just making more content for it. And so do, do you both sort of, I know that this, you've talked about this being sort of more of um, your own sort of project, Nelson, but in terms of a screen print and the projects, do you do you collaborate a lot? Sort of what is, um, does, the, does the studio have like a, a specific focus or sort of things that you're interested in exploring together? Uh, right, right now the, the mission for our studio is, is definitely to try and, I think with a lot of other people, try and create digital experiences that actually obviously integrate a lot of our analog and physical life and try and mediate between those two. So mm. the example of Dustnet, what what is what is the intellectual property of Counter-Strike and Dust in relation to my day-to-day -day life? And what does it mean to me? <laughs> and can intellectual property love me back? Uh, <laughs> and, and that was why this project was cathartic and trying to explore those, those feelings because creating a game like Counter-Strike that I had spent so much of my life playing was was a difficult thing to process. And then bring that to other people, right? Like what, how can we eke out those digital spaces from you know, the screens they're trapped behind? And, and wait, when you said that you were trying to find out if, if IP could love you back, what was the answer to that question? Did it? I don't think so. <laughs> I think that I think the what? answer is well, you, you got, you got um, the loading screens. Me, like, I love it. That, it works. Yeah, I think I think you just have to build your own thing is the answer. I'm not quite sure, you know, <laughs> looking into someone else's creation, you're going to quite find your own answers, but you can try. Yeah, if you're trying to, exactly, if you're trying to set out with these expectations that uh, you're you're expecting something back emotionally from IP, that's, maybe that's not the answer. Maybe, um, maybe the IP was um, inside us all along, or it was the friends that we made along the way. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, if, if, Dust 2 did die, it would mean everyone forgot it, so I mean, no one's really loving it anymore. So the fact that it lives and continues is kind of, uh, people love it in some way, and it's loving them back, but yeah. when that stops, I think it's, happens, some, see. it's something that I really love about, again, as somebody who um, hasn't doesn't play sort of games like Counter-Strike and doesn't play games like um, Team Fortress or really... Uh, admittedly sort of anything that's part of like the source family tree but there's something about that and I know Robbie Yang's talked about this as well about sort of um and for me it's sort of understanding games in that sort of sense of them being performances but I, I I appreciate that there's ways in which you can engage and you can appreciate um video games from that sort of external sort of spectator position or spe position of a, as a spectator and sort of for me that's I, I find these works and I find the games and I find everything that sort of comes off that family tree so fascinating because it is just this sprawling sort of net of like digital creativity and different languages that carry sort of um, like some of the um, the character traits of the works that have gone before them and I think and maybe maybe I'm wrong in sort of saying that maybe I should, part of me likes the fact that I'm a bit ignorant about a lot of that that I instead I pick up these little bits of folklore and so um, and I think that's why I like this work as well, that that sort of plays in this idea of this sort of speculative, sort of half-remembered or sort of half-truth of a history or a future. Yeah, I think it definitely is a spectator, because I'm not someone who's played Counter-Strike since 1999. I, I love that, that I can come back to it and and enter into that, that lexicon without necessarily being there from day one, right? Like part of I think what's interesting about this is sharing that that knowledge and the, and the folksy part of it. Um, and what's interesting actually is as we're doing this right now, there's a Counter-Strike tournament that has 150,000 viewers right now as well. <laughs> <laughs> so people, people are tuning in to watch, you know, professionals play this right now, possibly on Dust2, right? And that, that to me is fascinating, even though I never have aspirations to be a professional you know, game athlete, that so many people are tuning in right now to watch someone play it uh, mm -hmm, live, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I definitely, like, I enjoy the idea that you have um, like a 
a movement system in Source that's been um, so much part of my muscle memory that I really, like, I, I feel there's like a choreography involved when I enter into a Source game where I understand how to move and how to act in it. So mm -hmm, with regards mm -hmm. to the whole performance part, the, the idea that there's this a genealogy in any game that comes out from that genealogy, I understand how to perform it um, innately. Yeah. So I, I, there's something really powerful to me about that. Um, and then feeling at home in a space like this and understanding its mechanisms. Yeah, there's something that, that I really, I mean, for me, that's stuff that I'm interested in as well as, and again, sort of, as somebody who's worked in institutions that sort of really push towards sort of archiving and preserving objects, but traditionally, um, perhaps more sort of traditional material objects, which, um, whereas video games, as I say, for me, are about this performance and that we can work towards archiving and preserving the digital, but actually, in order to be able to access and to be able to experience those works in the same way that exactly as you say, it's like the muscle memory. What about, how do you archive, how do you preserve that? And like, for me, I'm really interested in exploring these ideas of um, actually how do you, how do you sort of, um, how do you potentially, not, I guess not preserve that, but how do you hand that down? How do you hand that sort of knowledge down? So these experiences and things, I mean, not necessarily that you need to archive and preserve one specific singular experience, but how do you sort of continue that and how do you build on that? Um, and it reminds me of um, some of the projects that institutions like MoMA have done about how they preserve performance art and curators who have actually learned the choreography of the dances themselves in order to be able to perform wow. it and to be able to pass that knowledge on. And it's like, actually, what can we learn in video games in terms of thinking about that choreography and that training and that sort of speculative approach to preserving not just the digital material side but also that very human side which is great to when you talk about sort of that muscle memory and that um that sense of choreography that sort of makes me think mm -hmm. about the natural connection between video games and performance that's I, I need to learn the choreography thing i think fortnite could create like a tool to help with that <laughs> for any performance art they just create a dance <laughs> and put it in task learning game. tool yeah and yeah, we yeah. have ta task inputs for every, yeah. every yeah. single game yeah, actually, I'm saying that and also makes me incredibly nervous to think that I'd have to be a curator that just has to learn how to play everything perfectly because I do not have good hand-eye coordination. I'm very bad at playing video games. <laughs> no, so we're good. A different performance. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, so we've got about five minutes left on the stream. Is there anybody in the chat that has any questions that they wanted to ask? Um, or if you do, please pop them in and we'll try and catch some of those um, before we finish. There's, yes, there's, there's um, still a couple of slots on the server that are open right now too, if anyone got kicked out or couldn't join. So two, two questions from the chat. Yes, um, it's Marie Falston, that's me, that's the woman talking, and Nilsson is uh, one of the guys talking, and Milan is the other guy talking. But so. twin brothers, so you can confuse us <laughs> if you have to. <laughs> I'm trying to think if I, I'm gonna exit out of the game for a second, if I forgot to say anything about this. Uh, I think the best way to obviously <laughs> see it, Dustin, is to experience it. It's a very relaxed game though, I mean obviously the music is mm -hmm. just comes and goes and you're kind of just meant to hang out and experience it. But now we have some really good structures to hopefully last on the server for a while now. We uh, got a lot of spears <laughs> and a lot of random uh, balls of water, so thank you for that. We encourage anyone to also apply as a janitor for uh, Dustnet and clean up all structures. We have a few signs of the spawn that will help you get started with that. <laughs> Who wants to come in and do some tidying? Yeah, you need to help prune every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, one of the questions in the chat is, do you think we're getting better at archiving this type of gaming experience? Hmm, that's a big question. Uh, no, I've already had to update it multiple <laughs> times. To, to, for the app stores especially, they have very, very um, intense policies that if your app doesn't follow, they'll just take it right off the store. So, no, I mean, honestly, keeping this game up and running is going to be a challenge for the next decade as I continually update it. Yeah. So that I mean, I think with... New computer policy. With with archiving, there's, there's really great um, and preservation. There's a lot of interesting, really smart people out there thinking and talking about this. And I think it's going to be just an ongoing challenge. I think we're better, but I think there's probably a lot better that we can be. But, um, but I think there's something about this sense of permanence. And I like the fact that we're talking about sort of janitors needed for here and sort of people um, and sort of the lost histories that 
I think for me, one of the challenges with people approaching games preservation at the moment is this the, the sense of vertigo that we can get when we think, okay, with the we have access to so much at the moment that we don't necessarily filter what it is, what it is that we we should be keeping and what it is that we should be um, preserving. The, the digital preservation is not about sort of archiving and preserving everything. It's about sort of being selective and curating certain things. But um, and maybe that happens naturally with communities. But yeah, I don't know. Quite it, what I don't know in. so much about the state of that, but it does seem like a community's taken it into their hands for the most part. It's not going to come from um, the publishers or companies. Yeah, so we've got a couple more minutes left on the chat. Is there anything? Um, is there anything else that you yourselves wanted to um, talk about with regards to with regards to the server? Is there anything that we've not seen that you wanted to show us? I know we're up high at the moment with. Uh... <laughs> uh, there's still a few secrets around the map. I'm scattered around, but uh, really, other than that, dust is a uh, is something that. It's too bad, right? It's hard to access my uh, understanding of Dust as someone who's played it versus a non-player, right? So, um, mm -hmm. I do want to like share so much of like what Dust means when and how you perform it, and that's one of the first prototypes is me performing playing Dust alone. Like, well, how do I move around the map in virtual space other than someone who hasn't really played Dust? Like, how do we perform that? So, I think back to performance. I think there is interesting aspects of how you might join Dustnet or see Dustnet as someone who hasn't played Counter-Strike versus who has, and the ways we perceive it differently. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, just come join the server with like a fresh set of eyes kind of thing. Um, but it's interesting to, to talk more about that and think about right my understanding of that space and how Malin talked about how he un intuitively understands Source Engine games and other virtual spaces based on previous experiences in those spaces. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm wondering and when so, you play Dustnet, what you see, Marie, versus what I'm seeing. So, so with regards to stuff that people have created um, this evening, so is this stuff going to stay on the server until the last person leaves, um, or whatever sort of created? How? It should stay on uh, forever and ever and ever, as long as I keep my web server running, <laughs> as long as that okay. physical computer box. <laughs> um, is able to you're able to download the map from that from that computer. You should be able to come back at any time and see what you built today. That's a, that's a big claim forever and ever. But um, forever and ever. We'll take it as, as long as we remember. <laughs> now play this. As long as somebody you know, keeps twenty one hundred, we we'll get there. Cool. Well, thank you both so much for your time this evening, this afternoon. Actually, where you are, uh, it's this afternoon, isn't it, or is it the morning? I don't know where anybody is. What whatever, whatever time of day it is. Um, I hope that time of day is treating you well. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for being on the stream and for playing um, and for handing out keys. Thanks for everybody who tuned in and watched. Thanks to everybody who joined the server and bunny hopped around. And yeah, and so that's um, that's it for uh, play Dustnet Live with the devs. Um, for now, play this uh, at home. We have one more final event that will be happening at eight o'clock this evening. And that is a photography tour with Gareth Damian Martin through No Man's Sky. And he'll be talking about um, sort of landscape photography, the history of landscape photography, and thinking about that through the, through the lens of uh, photographing virtual spaces in No Man's Sky. So do check back in um, at eight o'clock if that sounds interesting to watch that field trip. I think spaces are all filled up for that now, um, but we will be streaming that. Um, and this along with other videos uh, for other virtual field trips and other streams, We'll be transcribing those over the coming weeks and we should be hosting them online if you've tuned in late or if you want to catch them at another point, then um, we should be posting those up for you. But yeah, thank you to everybody who tuned in. Thank you for, um, thank you to Nelson. Thank you to Milan. And um, yeah, and have a good evening all. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you.